Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 17th of August 2020. Displayed are the list of news articles along with the page numbers of five different editions. Let us now begin our analysis. Our first discussion for the day is based on the recent verdict by the Supreme Court on the recent contempt of court proceedings initiated by it against one of its advocates. It found that advocate Prashant Bhushan was guilty of contempt of court on two of his tweets. One was on the current Chief Justice of India riding an expensive motorcycle while the court was in lockdown, and the other tweet was about the role of the last four Chief Justices of India. In case of the first tweet, the Supreme Court bench held that the tweet was not against the Chief Justice of India in his individual capacity, but as an head of the judiciary. So this reason qualified the first tweet to be considered as contempt of court. and in case of second tweet the supreme court held that that particular tweet tends to give an impression that the highest constitutional court of the country had played a role in the destruction of indian democracy in the last 6 years now this topic has gained much importance in the recent times and there are various heated debates that are going on in this regard so one cannot rule out chances for a question to appear from this topic in your prelims as well as in your mains So in the context of this editorial let us discuss some facts related to contempt of court from exam perspective the syllabus that is relevant to the analysis of this editorial is given here for your reference first let us quickly refresh what does contempt of court mean see as per the contempt of courts act of 1971 there are two types of contempt a civil contempt and a criminal contempt a civil contempt means willful disobedience to any judgment or decree or direction or order or writ or other process of a court or a willful breach of an undertaking given to a court when you come to criminal contempt it means a publication of any matter or doing any other act which scandalizes or tends to scandalize or lower or tends to lower the authority of any court and when it comes to punishment know that a contempt of court may be punished with a simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months or with a fine which may extend to 2000 rupees or it might be both and in case of this prashant bhushan it was a criminal contempt now let us see some of the constitutional provisions related to contempt of court know that indian constitution devotes two articles for dealing with contempt power of the supreme court they are articles 129 and 142 clause 2 See article 129 says that the supreme court shall be a court of record and shall have all the powers of such a court including the power to punish for the contempt of itself and the same goes with the case of high court which is mentioned in article 215 see this article 129 is supplemented by article 142 clause 2 this article deals with the investigation and punishment of the contempt of the supreme court So article 129 confers substantive power of the Supreme Court to punish for the contempt of itself and this article 142 clause 2 supplements this article 129 by specifically conferring the power of investigation and punishment. Now regarding this article 129 there was a news that appeared in yesterday's edition that is 16th August in that news article The Supreme Court bench that dealt with the contempt case of Mr Prashant Bhushan also held that the court has sua motu contempt powers to take cognizance of the contempt and this power is given by article 129 the supreme court said that the only requirement is that the procedure followed is required to be just and fair and in accordance with the principles of natural justice here remember the word suo motu it means that the supreme court need not take the consent of anybody to punish someone for contempt of court because the supreme court is exercising its inherent powers as provided in the constitution to issue a notice for contempt so remember both these articles from exam perspective now let us see how the concept of contempt of court is used in different parts of the world in this regard according to the law commission report contempt of court exists in many countries like united states and united kingdom but if you see it is rarely used by these countries this means that even though the judicial authorities are criticized by the citizens they are rarely punished by the court so these are some of the facts that you need to know about contempt of court from exam perspective now let us come to this editorial in this editorial the author mainly raises voice against the verdict of supreme court here keep in mind that this editorial is critical about the recent verdict of supreme court on this issue of contempt of court the author of this editorial tells that the recent verdict of supreme court shows that the supreme court has low threshold for its tolerance towards criticism 
Here the author tells that in this particular case, Mr. Prashant Bhushan merely made a criticism on an authority and he did not use any kind of unparliamentary words in his tweets. But the Supreme Court has not made any deep analysis while pronouncing this verdict. Why the author tells this? Because in the first tweet of the Chief Justice of India riding bike, he tells that that particular tweet does not undermine the court's dignity or it does not undermine the authority or it does not interfere with the administration of justice. It only touches partially on the Chief Justice of India's personal conduct and partially on his administrative decision making. So the author tells that it cannot be qualified for criminal contempt. Now coming to the second tweet which we saw earlier, the author tells that this particular tweet is clearly in the nature of a political opinion. So the author questions how a mere voicing of an opinion that the successive Chief Justice of India have destroyed democracy can undermine the public trust in the judiciary. Why? Because here the author takes the example of some of the former judges who also resorted to criticizing the judiciary. If you remember, before few years back, there were some former judges who had gone public with a media conference in order to criticize the then sitting Chief Justice of India. They alleged that the Chief Justice of India was greatly influenced by the executive and they also criticized the master of the roster concept. That is the power which the Chief Justice of India has to allocate the cases to different benches. So the author has questioned that how a simple tweet can undermine public trust in the judiciary when some judges themselves criticize the then Chief Justice of India. Now if you look at this Supreme Court verdict, the Supreme Court said that if such contempt of court goes unpunished, then it would lower the country's image in the Committee of Nations. For this, the author tells that the Supreme Court has built its reputation in front of the world not through punishing of contempt. It gained the respect of the world through its high quality judgments which were given for empowering the citizens of India and also for the social, economic and political upliftment of the downtrodden people of India. And it was also because of the court's fearless independence that upheld the dignity of the court. So the author tells that the Supreme Court has not built its reputation through punishing of contempt. And according to the author of this editorial, the reputation of the Supreme Court can be damaged only for a few reasons. The first reason which the author has mentioned is the growing perception of judicial evasion. That is when the world and the country thinks that our courts are restraining from deciding on a case due to the pressure from the executive. The second reason which the author mentions is self-imposed retinence. That is where the court is silent with respect to problems that are happening in the nation. For this particular reason, we have one more news article today, which is titled India's moving towards a form of elected autocracy. In this, one of the former chief justice of Delhi High Court has mentioned that the Supreme Court is either ignoring or delaying cases related to the important issues, such as the recent bifurcation of Kashmir, then the recent Citizenship Amendment Act, and even in the case of electoral bonds. So the second reason is self-imposed retinence. Now coming to the third reason which is quiet acquiescence. It means that the court accepts things without any deep analysis or without any deep scrutiny due to the pressure from the executive. So these are the reasons which are mentioned by the author because of which the reputation of Supreme Court can be damaged. So these are some of the points discussed by the author in this editorial. So to conclude this editorial, what is the key takeaway? It is the contempt of court should not be allowed to be used as means to prevent criticisms. In contemporary times, it is quite important that courts be accountable, courts be transparent and they do impartial probes rather than threats of contempt action. So here, the courts mainly need to be accountable. For this, we have one more editorial, which is a next discussion. With this, we come to the end of the analysis of this editorial and few other news articles along with which we saw. If you see, there is one more news article where Mr. Prashant Bhushan is facing one more contempt case against him in the Supreme Court for which the hearing has been scheduled today. We shall discuss more on this in our future news analysis. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. Now let us look at this OPED article which is again based on the recent Supreme Court judgment which held senior lawyer Prashant Bhushan guilty of contempt of the court. Now why we have chosen this OPED article is because this article discusses the same issue from ethics perspective. So sometimes very rarely you get editorials and uh, OPED articles from ethics perspective. So let us try to see what the author of this editorial discusses. 
the relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. As you can see here, the title of this news column is The Cost of Stifling Voices. What does it mean? Stifling voices mean that the voice or criticism of the public or civil society is suppressed by the authority. For example, an elderly woman was booked under criminal act by CID in Andhra Pradesh for sharing a post against the chief minister. And if you see similar incidents happen now and then across country, we also have an example in Tamil Nadu in the year 2003 when five journalists of the Hindu newspaper were arrested for being critical of the policies of the then ruling government. And even if you see similar incident happened in Karnataka where the speaker ordered the arrest of two journalists for breaching the privileges of the house. So this is what is meant by stifling the voices. And what is the cost or consequence of such suppression of criticism is the context of today's news column. As we just saw during our first news article, the senior lawyer Mr. Prashant Bhushan shared two tweets which are perceived to be against the institutions of Supreme Court and the Chief Justice of India. So, Suomotu contempt of court proceedings were charged against Mr. Prashant Bhushan by the Supreme Court and recently was convicted for the same. In this case, while adjudicating, the Supreme Court took a position on an important ethical question. The question is, do we strengthen or weaken institutions by criticizing some of the actions of those holding public office? For this question, the Supreme Court was of the opinion that criticism may weaken the institutions. See, this is quite unfortunate because democracy is built on the bedrocks of deliberation and debate. And as we all know, there is no debate without criticism. To explain this further, the author of this editorial takes the example from a book named Exit, Voice and Loyalty. According to the author of this book, Exit and Voice are the two alternative mechanisms for the repair of societal institutions. So what is Exit and what is Voice? Now let us take an example, when consumers switch from one company to another or when an employee moves to a job with better working conditions or when a family moves across neighborhoods, all of these three cases are exercising exit. It means we are just moving away without raising our voice. Now take another example, when a partner in a marriage complains of abuse or when workers protest against management action, it is voice. Generally if you see, we raise our voice and exit from the issue. For example, if your mobile service provider, say Jio or Atel, is not offering good service, first we will complain, which is voice. And if this complaint is not addressed properly by the service provider, then we shift to another company, which is exit. So you can see that exit and voice work together. And without any possibility of exit, voices would remain unheard. And in a condition where exit is too easy, then very few people would invest in voice. Now assume that there is only one mobile service provider in India and you don't have any other option to switch to another company which is a classic example of monopoly. In this case, you don't have a choice, then your voice will not be heard. So these are some of the scenarios discussed by the author to explain what is meant by exit and what is meant by voice. Here the author takes one more example. He tells that the public health and education work best in those countries which are inclusive. That is when all sections of the society in that particular country are represented. When the wealthy and the most educated exit or shift to private providers, then the public systems are often starved of resources and ideas. Similarly, in politics if you see, exit is used at the time of elections while the voice makes the elected leaders accountable. So you can see with all these examples why voice is very important and stifling or suppressing the voice is not good for any society, especially for a democratic country like India. Now if the voice or the criticism is suppressed, how can the institutions be accountable? So now comes a very important question which is accountability. What is accountability? It is to take complete responsibility by the person for what he did or what he failed to do. That person must be able to give a satisfactory reason for the same and the use of authority that is entrusted in that person to carry out that particular responsibility. Being accountable not only means being responsible for something but also ultimately being answerable for your own actions. If you look at ethics and governance, accountability is answerability, blameworthiness, liability on the expectation of account giving. So all these three aspects are expected in ethics and governance. Now coming to our current context, it would have been much better if the Chief Justice of India or the Supreme Court were answerable for the actions they have reportedly done. 
Just a quick recap of the issue. Know that Mr. Prashant Bhushan tweeted a photo of Chief Justice of India riding 50 lakh rupees bike without helmet or face mask during lockdown period. And for this social media post, Mr. Prashant Bhushan was convicted for scandalizing the authority of court. But later, if you see, Mr. Prashant Bhushan himself apologized that he missed something in the picture that he posted that the bike was in parking mode. Here, what the author tries to emphasize is it would have been better if the Chief Justice of India or the Supreme Court were answerable for the actions that they have reportedly done. So, while concluding this editorial, the author says that the courts exist to promote justice by adjudicating on disagreements. For example, courts usually take a very critical view of the other arms of government, that is the legislature and executive. And throughout the history of governance, if you see, by scrutinizing the behavior of the legislative and executive arms, the judiciary, that is the court, did not lower the dignity that is associated with those offices, or it did not undermine the democracy. On the contrary, if you see from a positive perspective, it in fact improved their functioning. And moreover, if you see, such scrutiny by the judiciary relied on the critical voices from the public and critical voices from the civil society. But in this case, if you see, the same judiciary, which is the guarantor of rights of public, has now taken a back step and it has punished a person from the public for being critical of its own functioning. Because if you remember, initially we saw that the Supreme Court is of the opinion that criticism may weaken the institutions. So you can see that the Supreme Court is contradicting itself. So what the author tries to conclude is that voice has the potential to strengthen institutions and help them adapt to a changing environment. Why? Because deliberation, debate and dissent are the bedrocks of any democracy. We should discuss, we should debate and we should criticize on any issues which are all necessary in a democracy. But if the voice is stifled, then we risk the disengagement of those who are most invested in preserving our democratic institutions. That is, those persons who are involved in the deliberation process, debate process, and even in the dissent process. So the author tells that when Mr. Prashant Bhushan tweeted against the Chief Justice of India or against the Supreme Court, he did not lower the authority of the court. But by criticizing, he tried to ensure that the Chief Justice of India and the Supreme Court are being accountable for what they are doing. So this is all about the discussion of this editorial. From this editorial, we saw the view of the Supreme Court, how criticism will weaken the institutions and what kind of ethical stand should the Supreme Court must have taken. And we try to link this with one of the facets of ethics, which is accountability especially accountability in ethics and governance. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article is about the domestic affairs of our neighborhood country, Sri Lanka. If you remember, during our 10th August Hindu news analysis, we discussed about the recently concluded parliamentary elections where the party led by Mahinda Rajapaksha, the Sri Lanka Pudujana Perumana, secured near to two-thirds majority in the elections. This news article discusses about certain points related to Tamil minority in Sri Lanka. We will mainly focus on the 13th Amendment and the 1987 Indo-Sri Lanka Accord. The syllabus that is relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. We know that the Rajapaksha brothers are at the helm of affairs of Sri Lanka at present, where Mahinda Rajapaksha is the PM and Kotabaya Rajapaksha is the President. If you look at the election results, they have exposed a fragmented political opposition in Sri Lanka, especially among the parties who represent the minority Tamil population. See, one of the major party which represented the Tamils was the Tamil National Alliance. It represented the Tamils in northern and eastern Sri Lanka since the end of civil war in 2009. But in the recent elections, if you see, their representation has largely reduced because they have just won 10 seats in this 225 member parliament. The author of this editorial tells that the Tamil voters chose candidates from hardline Tamil nationalist groups critical of this Tamil National Alliance. They even elected candidates from parties aligned to Rajapaksha's party. This happened because the Tamil voters moved away from their political concerns due to the growing economic distress. Here, just have an idea that the majority of the Tamil population in Sri Lanka live in the northern provinces that includes Jaffna, Mullaitivu, Mannar, etc. And the Northern Provincial Council was under the leaders of the Tamil National Alliance from 2013 till 2018. 
though they were in power they focused mainly on the political devolution the author tells that they failed to revive the economy of the tamil population post the civil war and also if you see at the national level this alliance was aligned to the maithripala sirisena ranil vikramasinghe government the author tells that this tamil national alliance was badly let down by this maithripala sirisena ranil vikramasinghe alliance and this led to a bad image among the tamil people due to which tna has faced a huge defeat in the recently concluded elections so in this context the author briefly mentions the economic grievances of the north and east of sri lanka he tells that the unemployment rate is high and the farmers are hit by droughts and floods and as of 2016 sri lanka's poverty head count was highest in the northern and eastern provinces So the shift in the voting pattern indicates the need for an urgent economic relief for this section of the Sri Lankan society. Here the author feels that the election results might counteract that is affect the Tamil community's long pending demand for greater political autonomy that is political devolution why because according to the author the prominent supporters of this Rajapaksha party have already sought the abolition of the provincial council system and the 13th amendment. So what is this 13th amendment know that the 13th amendment of the Sri Lankan constitution is an outcome of the Indo Sri Lanka accord of 1987 know that it was signed by former indian prime minister rajiv gandhi and the then president of sri lanka jayawardene it was signed at colombo know that it is an important agreement since it desires to preserve the unity sovereignty and territorial integrity of sri lanka by acknowledging that sri lanka is a multi ethnic and multilingual plural society why multi ethnic because there are sri lankans there are tamils and there are people from other ethnicity like vedas and why multilingual not only sinhalese is spoken there even languages like tamil are spoken so this 1987 accord paved the way for the 13th amendment to the sri lankan constitution This 13th amendment says that Tamil shall be one of the official languages in Sri Lanka along with Sinhalese. And also if you see this 13th amendment has provisions to ensure devolution of power to the people of the north and east that is the Tamil people. So you can see that this 1987 agreement and the 13th amendment is essential for Tamils in Sri Lanka in order to achieve their desire for greater control of their lives in a legitimate manner. The author feels that proper devolution of power is central to both political and economic development of Tamil minorities in Sri Lanka. This is because only devolved political power can enable citizens to build, strengthen and access their local administrative structures. As we know, this minority Tamil community suffered the most during the civil war that ended in 2009 and they are trying to just come out of that trauma and rebuild their lives. So this voting pattern by the Tamils in the recently concluded elections indicate their political as well as socio-economic priorities. Why because the Tamil National Alliance promised for political as well as economic devolution but nothing really came out of the previous 5 years of rule. So let us hope that the elected leaders at present will resolve the legitimate issues of Tamils to build a just and dignified future for them. This is all about the discussion of this news article. From this news article try to know about the 1987 Indo-Sri Lankan Accord and the 13th amendment from exam perspective. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article speaks about various measures that are to be adopted to hold the monsoon session of parliament. like usage of the chambers and galleries for holding the session then usage of polycarbonate separators with arrangements in compliance with the physical distancing norms that are to be observed in view of the covid-19 pandemic one such measure which has been mentioned in this news article is the ultraviolet germicidal irradiation system which is to be used for the air conditioners so let us discuss in detail about this science fact First you need to know about electromagnetic radiation know that it is a form of energy that is all around us and it takes many forms based on the wavelength and the frequency as you can see in this picture radio waves microwaves x-rays gamma rays visible light all form a part of this electromagnetic radiation and one such is the uv light that is the ultraviolet light Know that the ultraviolet radiation that reaches earth from sun has a wavelength between 290 and 400 nanometers. If you see this is shorter than wavelengths of visible light. The wavelengths of visible light are from 400 to 700 nanometers. Here know that the ultraviolet waves are invisible to the human eye. 
See the ultraviolet spectrum is commonly divided into three types based on the wavelength. Ultraviolet A, Ultraviolet B and Ultraviolet C. Among these three, Ultraviolet C rays are the most harmful and are almost completely absorbed by your atmosphere. So this is in brief that you need to know about the ultraviolet light. Now let us see what do we mean by ultraviolet germicidal irradiation that is mentioned in this news article. See, public health concerns like the recent COVID-19 pandemic have intensified the efforts to prevent their transmission, that is the transmission of airborne infections using environmental controls. And this ultraviolet germicidal irradiation is one such control which is safe and which is highly effective in disinfecting the air, thereby preventing the transmission of a variety of airborne infections. As the name indicates, this irradiation method uses the ultraviolet energy to either kill or inactivate various microbial species, be it virus, bacteria or fungus. Know that the entire ultraviolet spectrum can kill or inactivate many microorganisms. But in specific, if you see, the ultraviolet C energy provides the most germicidal effect. This has an optimum wavelength of 265 nanometer that provides this germicidal effect. Now you need some lamps to emit this particular ultraviolet C light. For this purpose, low pressure mercury discharge lamps are commonly used in the germicidal application to emit this ultraviolet C. And this ultraviolet C radiation kills or activates the microbes by damaging their DNA, that is deoxyribonucleic acid or the RNA in case of certain viruses. Know that this ultraviolet germicidal irradiation can be used to disinfect air, water and even the surfaces but if you see usually the surface disinfection is quite limited. The water disinfection is currently the most advanced and accepted germicidal application. And even air disinfection is accomplished through this irradiation method. There are several methods like irradiating the upper room air only or irradiating the entire room or irradiating the air as it passes through enclosed air circulation and heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems. So this news article mentions the usage of ultraviolet germicidal irradiation system in the air conditioning system of Rajya Sabha for killing the microbes in the air supply. So this is all about the discussion of this news article. Whenever you study about ultraviolet rays, just remember a fact, the ultraviolet lamps should not be used to disinfect hands or other areas of your skin directly. Why? Because the ultraviolet radiation can cause skin irritation and it might even damage your eyes. So just remember this fact. With this information, now look at this question. Arrange the following radiations in the increasing order of their wavelengths. Visible light, radio waves, ultraviolet, microwaves, infrared. Here the correct order is ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwaves and radio waves as you can see in this picture. So the correct answer is option C 31542. To conclude, whenever you are coming across such scientific terms, try to know the basic science behind that particular technology. Usually UPSC tests only the basic facts related to a particular technology. Now let us move on to the next news article. Now let us look at this question about national cadet crops which has been framed based on this news article which speaks about the defense minister's approval to expand this national cadet crop scheme in all the border and coastal districts. It has been planned to inject at least one lakh cadets from the border and coastal districts among which one third would be the girl cadets. And according to the ministry, the army will provide training and administrative support to the NCC units which are located in the border areas and the Indian Navy will provide the support to those units in the coastal areas and Indian Air Force to those units close to Air Force stations. In this context, let us have a brief discussion about NCC, its aim and functions. Know that it is youth development movement in India which is open to all the regular students of schools and colleges which is on a voluntary basis. Remember this fact, it is on a voluntary basis. So NCC will enroll cadets at the high school and college level and uh, they will also award certificates on completion of training in various phases. Know that it came into existence under the National Cadet Corps Act 31 of 1948. The motto of NCC is unity and discipline. Know that NCC comes under the Ministry of Defense. These are some of the aims of NCC, one of which is to create a pool of organized, trained and motivated youth with leadership qualities in all walks of life. Now coming to the composition of NCC, know that it is headed by the Director General who is an army officer of the rank of Lieutenant General. He is assisted by two additional Directors General 
one a major general from the Indian Army and other a rear admiral from the Indian Navy or an air vice marshal from the Indian Air Force. Coming to the training, know that the institutional training like basic military training to the cadets are given as a part of the curriculum. It is to prepare them in order to join the armed forces. And other important aspects of NCC training include various training camps, adventure activities, military training, etc. So this is in brief about NCC and this news article discussion. Now look at this question about NCC. It is a three statement question and you need to choose those statement or statements which are incorrect. Look at the first statement. It speaks about one of the aims of NCC. It is a correct statement as we saw during our discussion. So if one is correct, you can easily arrive at the answer which is option C, 2 and 3 since you need to choose those statement or statements which are incorrect. So be careful when you read the question. Now look at the second statement. It is wrong because NCC was created by an act of parliament as we saw, not by an executive order. And third statement is incorrect because it comes under the Ministry of Defense, not under the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. So the correct answer is option C, 2 and 3, 1 B. Now let us move on to the next news article. Now let us look at this question. The question is which one of the following funds is created in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic? Here the correct answer is option D, Prime Minister's Citizen Assistance and Relief in Emergency Situations Fund, also known as PM Cares Fund. This question has been framed based on this news article. Now if you look at the remaining options, option A, Prime Minister's National Relief Fund, know that it was set up in 1948 based on an appeal by the then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. It was established with public contributions in order to assist the then displaced persons from Pakistan after the partition. And if you look at option B, the National Disaster Response Fund is financial mechanism which has been set up at the national level under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. And if you look at option C, National Calamity Contingency Fund, it has been merged with NDRF. This fund was present before this NDRF fund. Now it is merged with this NDRF fund. So here the correct answer is option D, PM Cares Fund. We have seen many times about this PM Cares Fund in our previous analysis. These are some of the points that you need to know about PM Cares Fund from exam perspective. You know that the ex-officio chairman is the Prime Minister of India and these are the ex-officio trustees of this fund and this fund entirely consists of voluntary contributions and there is no budgetary support for this fund and there are IT exemptions as well. Now let us focus on this news article. Why? Because right from the constitution of this fund there were a lot of controversies with the new fund. First, the opposition asked, what's the necessity of creating a new fund when there is already a Prime Minister's National Relief Fund? And then if you see, there were many RTA applications which were filed on this PM Cares Fund, but they were not answered properly or rejected. One such issue has happened the day before, which has been discussed in this news article. This news article tells that the Prime Minister's office has denied a right to information request related to this PM Cares Fund on the grounds that providing details about this fund would disproportionately divert the resources of the office. Under the RTA Act, the RTA application can be rejected if it disproportionately diverts the resources of the office from the efficient discharge of its normal functions. Now, by using this provision from the RTI Act, the Prime Minister's office rejected the RTI application that is filed with respect to this PM Cares Fund. So, this is in brief about this news article. Try to know about PM Cares Fund from Prelims perspective. So, the correct answer for this question is option D. Let us move on to the practice questions discussion session. Look at this first question on contempt of court. It is a two statement question and you need to choose two statement or statements which are correct. Look at the first statement. It is a correct statement. The power of Supreme Court to punish for its contempt is a constitutional power. It is as per articles 129 read along with article 142 clause 2. Now look at the second statement, it tells that the Supreme Court does not have powers to take sewer more to cognizance of contempt of court. This statement is incorrect because as per the recent judgment delivered by Supreme Court, it said that it has powers to take sewer more to cognizance of contempt of court. So here the correct answer is option A, 1 only. Now look at this map based question, five ports are given, which of the above are located in Sri Lanka? Gale, Yangon, Trincomalee, Sitwe, Hambantota. Here, Gale, Trincomali and Hambantota ports are located in Sri Lanka. So, the correct answer is option D, 1, 3 and 5. The remaining two ports, Yangon and Sitwe are located in the country of Myanmar. So, whenever you come across important ports in news, try to make a note of it from geography perspective. So, the correct answer is option D, 1, 3 and 5, 1D. 
With this, we come to the end of the analysis of all the news articles taken up for today's discussion and also the practice questions discussion session. If you like the video, press the like button, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for latest videos and updates. Stay focused and motivated friends. Thank you.